So this is Massive. There are three different views or three different tabs. Right now we're in the synthesis tab. This is where you'll be spending most of your time designing sounds. Then there's also an attributes tab. We can look at attributes of a particular preset that has been loaded in. You can also define attributes for a preset. And then you have the browser tab where you can load in presets. So over here you have all the different presets. There's a huge collection here. Uh, but to narrow it down, you can also use this bank type subtype and mode selector so for example if i'm looking for a base i can click on base and you'll see that list got a bit smaller i can narrow my search down to analog base by clicking here now i have a smaller list of presets and i can further select a mode uh, let's say processed so now i have only these particular presets that have these three tags so let's say i double click to load in this preset That's what that sounds like. You get eight different uh, macro controls that you can quickly change up. So let's say I want to change the DK on this particular base. Bit crush it a bit more. So a quick way to modify a preset without going into the details in the synthesis tab. Technically, it's actually these eight macro dials that you see. So those same things are available over here. These each uh, macro controls can also be MIDI controlled. We can select a particular MIDI CC value from here. Uh, we can go back into the attributes page and we can see who made this preset. This was made by Dennis DeSantis. Uh, and these are the different tags that are associated with this particular preset. We can obviously go and change this as well. So that's how the browser works. You basically select a preset like this. You can also view the browser uh, like this, as in different folders. You can look at specific um, expansion packs. Or you also have a favorites folder. I have nothing in here, but I suppose you can just click and drag and add things to your favorites. So now I have this in my favorites. Let's now check out some of the menu options you have in Massive. You can actually click on this icon over here and a splash screen will pop up, letting you know which version you're running. I'm running 1.5.1 right now. I'm not sure if that is the latest one, but that's what I'm running right now. I can click anywhere on this screen and it'll just go away. Let's check out the file menu. You can load in a new sound. So it basically, so if I had, go to the browser and load in a different preset. So now if I go to file and hit, let me just go to the synth tab, hit file, go to new sound. So you notice that the entire preset has been reset back to this default sawtooth based preset. So that's for file new sound. You can also open a specific preset anywhere that you've stored on your computer. Recent files, any recent presets that you loaded. I only loaded this one, so that's the only one that's showing up over here. You can save the preset, you can save as. Uh, you can import older versions of the presets. So older version of massive presets had the extension .kst. Um, so they don't work uh, directly in massive right now, so you kind of need to import them. And you can also do a batch conversion if you have a whole bunch of KST presets you want to convert to the new version. Let's, let's check out the options menu here. So under the general tab, you can set up a default author. So for example, if I put my name there, every time I create a new sound or if I save a sound as, that's gonna be the default author. There's some MIDI options here and never play with these. Uh, in the browser tab, you have a few more options. I find this quite helpful. So in this database, hit count display, we can indicate empty categories or show count as number. Or leave it as none. Let's check out show count as a number. This is kind of helpful. So if I go into the browser, I notice in each category you have a number associated with that, letting you know how many presets there are in each of those categories. The other option there was to show uh, indicate empty categories. So even if it's not available, if there's no preset available in one of these categories, it'll still uh, be available for you to click on it. All right, then you have the default location of where the presets are stored. You can't change that, but you can add more folders. So let's say you stored your massive presets in a different location. You can bring them in here. 
so then when you search in the browser you can actually find them uh, a lot of times you may notice that when you open up massive and you open up the browsers tab all the presets are missing so you can hit that so you can hit that rebuild database button and that'll just rebuild the database and reload all the presets in so those are the options let's get out of here there's a help category to open the manual and launch the service center um, voices so right now it's showing us how many voices are being used out of the total available voices so if I play some notes right now that number dynamically changes that number does not change but you can change that in inside the synth we look at that later on MIDI channel receive or MIDI receive channel or RX is set to all but you can choose a specific uh, MIDI channel CPU usage right now only 1% of the CPU is being used uh, this will obviously change depending on how intense your uh, sound is uh, next is the um, option for the quality of the sound so I would suggest leaving this at ultra for preset as well as global but if you notice your CPU usage is going up really high you can drop this to high or even eco but just be aware that it will you will be sacrificing uh, the sound quality for CPU usage generally on newer computers you don't have to touch this you can leave this at ultra and it should be just fine you can hit this button this is um, to disable all sounds kind of like a MIDI panic button so if you notice that some note is stuck you can just hit that button and just it'll just turn off all the sounds coming out of massive you can browse through your presets the next and previous by clicking these up and down arrows so for example if I load in this Beavis preset if I hit that next preset it goes down to this one go previous so I can kind of scroll through all the presets that I see over here in the browser uh, save save as so you can quickly access that same option that you have over here uh, and yeah that's it so that's the file menu in massive so let's check out all the different modules that you get in massive there are three oscillators you can turn them on by clicking over here oscillator 1 oscillator 2 and oscillator 3 you get a modulation oscillator you also get a noise generator and there's also a feedback section so this is your sound generation aspect of Massive. Next, up top here, you have a filter section. You get two filters. You can click here and change out the filter type. There are different ways of how to route your signal through the filters. There's also a mix control to mix between the two filters. And finally, there's an amp section with a panel dial. There's a bypass section. You can turn that on. So you can bypass any of these sound sources to skip any of the filtering or any of the processing and directly go to the output through this. I'll show you how that's done later on. Then finally, there's a master volume control. Now within the signal path, you can introduce two insert effects. You can see over here, insert one and insert two. And these are the different effects that you get. Towards the tail end, you can also add in two additional effects, effects one and effects two. And these are the different effects you get in there. The two lists are slightly different. We'll check those out in detail later on. In the middle section over here, you have different options for your oscillator, your key tracking for the oscillator, key tracking for the filter, the voicing tab where you can adjust unisono and a bunch of other things over here. We'll look at in detail later on. This is a very helpful tab that shows you how the signal flows from one module to another in Massive. Uh, some things can be changed over here. For example, this is a bypass signal, so I can choose which source is going to be bypassed. I can also change where the insert is placed and I can also change where the feedback happens. Uh, aside from that, everything else is predefined. There's a global tab here for some global settings and some pretty interesting randomized options. This middle section over here, you get all the modifiers. So you get four different envelopes and four different LFOs. The LFOs can work as a regular LFO or can work as a performer as well as a step sequencer. Then finally in the bottom here you have the macro control section. We saw this also in the browser category. Let's now check out the oscillator section. I'm going to start from scratch. So I'll hit file new sound. So we get this basic sawtooth tone. So right now only one oscillator is running. The three oscillators are identical. So if you know how to use one, you know how to use the other two. 
Now this is a wavetable base synth, so you actually get a bunch of different wavetables you can select from. So right now we have this square dash saw one wavetable loaded in. Right now the wavetable position dial is set all the way to the right, so we're hearing the sawtooth. But if I move the wavetable position all the way to the left, I'll get the square. And of course when that wavetable position is anywhere in the middle, you get a blend of those two waveforms. Now that's from the basic category. We also get this analog electric category. Let's check out some of these. Let's say for example, Grown 4. So the wavetable is a bit more complex. There's some digital hybrid waveforms, or sorry, wavetables. Let's try Squelchy. And FX chords. You notice I'm just playing, I'm just holding down one note. But we can hear a core type effect coming out of that because that's built into the wavetable. There's also this virtual analog category where you get a couple of pulse and pulse width modulation and sync options. So that's uh, oscillator one in terms of the wavetables. Uh, let's talk about the other controls here. There's this intensity control. So if I switch back to the sawtooth. So the intensity acts like a filter. And when you bring that down, the sawtooth gets more and more filtered. Think of it like a low pass filter. And this is pretty self-explanatory. It's just your amp volume control for that oscillator. There's a pitch control, so you can pitch this oscillator up or down. It goes all the way down to 64 semitones and up 64 semitones as well. You can browse through the different wavetables by clicking on these arrows here. There are different modes for the wavetable. Right now it's in spectrum mode. So depending on which mode you select, this middle dial will change to show parameters for that particular mode. So in spectrum dial, sorry, in spectrum mode we get this intensity dial. But if I switch to bend plus, this intensity dial works a bit different. So let's switch back to the sawtooth. Let's bring the intensity dial all the way down. So now we get our pure sawtooth, but if I crank up that amount, the waveform gets bent. Let's try this with a sine waveform. So intensity all the way down, we get a pure sine wave. So you can see that bending. So that's bend plus, then there's also bend minus. So it just works the other way around. So you can see the bend happens in the other direction. Then you get bend minus plus, which combines both those two bends. So if your intensity dial is in the center, you get no bending. But if I move to the positive, we get one kind of bend. And negative, you get another kind of bend. Next is the formant mode. So in formant mode, you get a bit more of an intense effect. So starting from the lowest, it's already affecting the sound a little bit. As you can see, that's no longer a pure sine wave. And you can hear additional harmonics are being added to that sine wave. And again, depending on the wavetable you select or the waveform you choose, the result will be different. So that's that form and shifting mode. And those are the different modes that you get over here. Lastly, you get a slider here to select between 
filter 1 or filter 2. In other words, to select if this oscillator sound is going to go to filter 1 or filter 2 or both simultaneously. Let's take a look at the noise generator. I'll turn it on and turn off oscillator 1. I'll crank up the amp so you actually hear it then. Right now it's set to a white noise, but we can click over here and select from any of these noise wavetables. And whichever wavetable you select, you can then change the color on that wavetable. The color dial gives this very interesting bit crushed slash slowing down kind of an effect. Let's try it on this paper wavetable. So now when I change the color dial, So that's basically how that works. Let's try one more. Let's maybe uh, murmur. In this wavetable, the slowing down and pitch shifting effect will be a bit more obvious. So that's your noise wavetable. You have that same slider to select if this noise generator is going to go to F1 or F2 or both simultaneously. Let's now check out the filter section. As you already know, there are two filters. And they're both identical, so we'll just check out one of them. I'll choose the filter type to be low pass 4, which is basically a four pole low pass filter or a filter or a low pass filter with a 24 dB per octave slope. So we have a sawtooth signal going in here. The two controls you get on the low pass 4 uh, filter are the cutoff, the filter cutoff as well as the resonance. So that's with no resonance and that's with quite a lot of resonance. So you get two of these low pass filters, four pole and two pole, two high pass filters. So the high pass filter also works the same way except that it cuts the low frequencies. There's an all pass filter that lets all frequencies through but messes with the phase when you have the resonance cranked up. So uh, technically a phaser actually uses an all-pass filter to create that phasing effect. If there's no resonance, you'll notice that cutoff doesn't really do much. So that's your all-pass filter, then there's a double notch filter. So there are two notches. We can't specifically tell where those two notches are because this style does not have uh, an indicator of what the value is set to. And also there's two of them, so and this style only shows you one position. But they're basically two notches in the entire frequency spectrum, and both of them are being modulated when I change this cutoff parameter. So that's your double notch. And there's a bandpass that is a combination of a low pass and a high pass. But you can also adjust the bandwidth. So that makes it very, very narrow or make it very, very wide. Next, you get a band reject, which is the opposite of a bandpass. So it cuts out the mid frequency ranges and keeps the lows and the highs. A bit similar to the um, uh, double notch filter. 
except that has two notches, band reject has one big notch. The scream is essentially a low pass filter, but has a scream parameter in the middle. You can hear that's a low pass filter, give it some resonance. But as you can tell, it does have that screaming effect. So if the scream dial is all the way down, still a bit different compared to the low pass filter, but with the scream up, it really screams. Now if your resonance is down, it's not gonna work. So the scream kind of works along with the resonance. So you need to have your resonance up for that scream dial to do anything. Next is this daft filter, which is again a low pass filter. This has a different response, sounds a bit different, so it's good to have options like this. Then you get this very cool comb filter. So there's a pitch control. Damping option. Strangely, when the damping is all the way down, then it sounds more damped. When you crank that up, you hear more of those higher frequencies. And feedback is very important for comb filtering. So with that feedback down, again, you don't hear any modulation at all. But with the feedback up. You can hear that very clear combing effect. So that's your comb filter. And lastly, there's acid filter, which is again, another low pass filter. But has a different response. So those are all the different filter types that are available. And you get the exact same list in filter too. Now let's look at all the different possibilities of routing within the two filters. You essentially get two types of routings, series or parallel. In series, the signal goes into the first filter, the sound gets filtered, and then that filtered sound goes into filter two, the sound gets filtered again, and then you hear the output. So let's set up an example of this. So let's say I have this sawtooth sound here. I'll send it to filter one only. Make sure this is in series. Let's load in a filter here. Let's say the low pass four. So the sound is being filtered. Uh, make sure the level on that filter is up. And then now this low pass filtered signal is gonna go to filter two. Let's load in a high pass filter here. Let's filter it again. Make sure the level on this filter is up. And we need to make sure the mix is set to mix two. So now this signal is going into filter one. It's getting filtered then goes into filter two, gets filtered again, and then we hear the result of that from mix two. Another option can be parallel. So in parallel, both the filters are running. So you wanna make sure that the oscillator is feeding both filters. So I'll leave that in the center. We can keep the two filters the same. And we wanna make sure the mix blend is set right in the middle. So we're hearing both signals simultaneously and equally. And as you can hear, there's a huge difference between those two types of signal paths. Of course, you can choose to uh, combine them in interesting ways. Like for example, I can put this in the center. So it's in series as well as parallel at the same time. But if I put my mix all the way up to mix one, then I've essentially broken that signal path and I'm only listening to the output coming out of filter one. If I move that all the way down, I'm only listening to the signal that's coming out of filter two. Check out the modulation oscillator. It's essentially a sine wave, an audio rate sine wave that can be used to modulate any of the three existing oscillators. You can also modulate the filter cutoff. So let's see this in action. I've turned it on and let's choose ring modulation for now. So you get four modes over here and you can switch between any of these four modes. So in ring mod, you get a ring mod dial, 
or think of it as a ring mod amount. I'll bring it all the way down for now. I can apply ring mod to any of the three oscillators, but not more than one simultaneously. So let's ring mod oscillator one. So ring modulation is basically the multiplication of the two oscillators. You get the result of that. So we have a sawtooth right now, and this is a sine wave. And if we crank up the ring mod amount, Now it doesn't sound too different because the pitch is exactly the same as oscillator one, the modulation oscillator's pitch that is. But if we change that, then you really start to hear that dissonance that you typically hear with ring modulation. Also, ideally you wanna be using a sine wave maybe. So we have two sine waves together being multiplied. And now you can clearly hear the sum and difference between the two sine waves. All right, so that's ring mod. Now let's check out phase modulation or frequency modulation. So same thing. Let me turn off ring modulation. So I'll bring the phase modulation down. Set this to zero for now. And let's crank up the amount. Now with FM, you tend to hear the effect even though the modulator and carrier both set to the same frequency. But if I change that, you can end up getting a pretty dissonant sound. Also changing up the waveform itself. Now to really hear what's happening, what we can do is bring the pitch of the modulation oscillator all the way down to the lowest, negative 64, and then hear this. So you can hear it's essentially pitch modulation, but at an audio rate. Let's move on to position. So position modulation is basically the modulation of this wavetable position dial. I'll turn off phase modulation for now and let's just hear that. Now, if we have a very simple wavetable like a sine square, we may not hear a very exaggerated effect with that. So let's try something a bit more complex like maybe AI. Let's set that in the center. And now let's hear some of this position modulation. And to really hear what's happening, we can bring the pitch down on this modulation sine wave. So imagine if I was just doing this. That's exactly what we're hearing. All right, so lastly, we also get filter FM. So I'll turn it on on this first filter here. Let's load in a filter. So now that sine wave is gonna be modulating the filter cutoff. Maybe I'll switch this back to a sawtooth. So the key with getting a more interesting result with the modulation oscillator is this pitch control here. If it's set to zero, meaning the same pitch as the audible oscillator, you're not gonna hear too much of an effect. Now take a look at this feedback section over here. So with the feedback module, you can take a portion of the signal and feed it back into itself, creating a feedback loop. In this routing tab over here, you can define where exactly that feedback happens. So you can see this is a feedback generator, uh, but you can choose to have it over here, right at the end. So the entire sound goes back into itself, or you can choose to have it here right before the amp slash pan section, or you can have it anywhere over here, right after filter one or filter two. 
and you can see that little blue line that indicates how the signal is fed back into itself. So I'll leave it there for now, right after filter one and this insert one. So let's test it out. So you have this amp control for the feedback signal. And generally with feedback, the higher it goes up, the loudest the signal becomes and the signal starts to distort. But you can do some interesting things with this. So for example, if I turn on this insert effect and I choose a simple delay, which is a very basic delay with just a time control and dry wet control. You can hear that there. Now if I increase this feedback signal, now we're actually hearing that on stage feedback you hear sometimes when people put the mic close to the speaker. But if I was to make this a bit more interesting, like make it a bit more plucky. So that's an example of using the feedback module. Now let's check out the insert effects. So you get two insert effects slots and each can have any of these effects. In the routing tab, you can choose where the insert effect is placed in your signal path. You can see over here, I can place the insert in these different locations. It can also be placed in this feedback path. One thing to note is that the two inserts cannot be placed in the exact same path simultaneously. So you can only have insert one or insert two over here. Same applies over here and all the other slots. So let's check out some of these effects. I'll turn on insert one. Let's place it right after filter one. And actually let's not even use a filter. We just hear a clean sawtooth signal going into this effect. We already looked at the simple delay. So essentially you get a dry wet control and a delay time control. Again, we don't get to see what the exact delay time is, but you can hear that this is a higher value and this is a shorter value. Next, you get a sample and hold, or in other words, a bit crushing type effect. Pretty extreme. The you also get an actual bit crusher. Now this, unlike the sample and hold, is very subtle. I'll crank up the dry wet. And you can hear that bit crushing is very, very subtle. Next is a standard frequency shifter. So you get a ring mod over here and a frequency shifter in the insert effects. You get another filter, a very basic high pass and low pass filter. And these are non-resonant filters. The last three are all distortion effects. So there's a sine shaper. Let's just use an actual sine wave for this. So that's distortion with the sine shaper. Let's try the parabolic shaper. Last, the hot clipper. So those are all the insert effects and insert two has the exact same list of effects. Let's now take a look at the master effects section. So you get two effects slots and these are the different effects that you get. You'll notice that effects one slot effects are a bit longer than the effects two slot. What's missing are three distortion effects. 
So in the effects one slot, you'll see we have these three tube distortion effects that are not available in effects two. Now, another main difference between the master effects and the insert effects are that the insert effects can be changed in terms of the position in the signal path, but the master effects cannot be changed. They reside over here, right before the EQ and the master. So let's check out some of these effects. There's a very nice reverb here. Let's hear this with a sine wave. If I crank up the size to maximum, density to maximum and color to maximum. You can get some pretty lush sounds with that. The small reverb is essentially the same algorithm as the other reverb effect, but the values are scaled down, meaning when the size is all the way to the maximum, it's much smaller when compared to the other reverb, as you can hear that. So this is with all the three parameters maxed out when the reverb small, but the full reverb, you can hear that size is much, much bigger. You get four different flanges. So essentially you get two stereo flanges and two mono flanges. The positive and negative basically define the phase difference in the modulated signal. So let's try the flanger positive. I'll tone down that feedback, modulation depth and modulation rate. Let's use a bit more of a complex waveform. I'm distorting a bit. I'll bring the master volume down. So you can hear that's clearly stereo, but if I choose the mono version, it's monophonic. Then you get three different choruses. Uh, this is the stereo chorus. Then there's a mono version of the same. And you also get a different algorithm, an ensemble algorithm. This is in stereo. After the chorus, you get two phasers, a regular stereo phaser and a mono phaser. So as I mentioned earlier, a phaser uses an all-pass filter, like the one we have over here, and modulates the cutoff. So this is the rate of modulation, and this is the amount of modulation. And that same signal is fed back into itself to create a more exaggerated effect. So that's the stereo version. Let's check out the mono version. Next, you get a delay. So it's a very basic delay. Uh, there's a damping control. So if the damping is all the way down, it completely kills the delayed signal. And if it's all the way up, it doesn't dampen the sound. You can set your delay left time and right time. Now you don't see actual values, so there's no way to specifically specify a delay time. And you also can't sync this to tempo. And there's also no feedback. So not a very helpful delay module, but this delay synced is much more helpful because you have feedback. And you also get these musical uh, values. So you can set it to, let's say, a quarter note. And you can set your left and right to be a different value. So let's say my right delay is going to be an eighth note and my left delay is going to be a half note. So that's your delay synced. Then there's this dimension expander, which is really hard to define, but it's best to hear what it does. So you get this, you just get this one control, the size control, and of course the dry wet control. So 
So it's making it slightly wider, slightly louder, bigger. So it works pretty well on almost any sound. So that's your dimension expander. And then you have three of those analog cell distortion units. Let's try this with a sine wave. Sounds pretty good on basses. That was the classic tube. Let's try the teletube. And then lastly, the Brauner tube. This one's a lot more aggressive. So three different flavors of distortion. And again, keep in mind in FX2, we do not have those three different distortion units. So that's the master effects section. As I've already mentioned, you get four envelopes and four LFOs. The LFOs can be swapped out to work as a performer or a stepper. Now, any of these modulators can be assigned to almost every parameter in Massive. Usually when you see a rectangular block like this, you know that you can place a modulator there. So for example, I can take this envelope, that little crosshair there, click and drag, and drop it on one of these blocks. And now when I click and drag up or down, So now when I click and drag upwards, I'm setting a positive modulation depth. And if I click and drag downwards, I'm setting a negative modulation depth. I can also right click and choose a modulator or swap out the modulator. Let's swap it out to an LFO. LFOs are bipolar, so you see to the two sides. So I can click and drag over here to invert that if I want to. You can also right click and completely remove it or mute it temporarily so it doesn't work but it's still sitting there. I'm just going to turn it off completely. Now by default, your fourth envelope is assigned to modulate the amp. So essentially, envelope four is your amp envelope. It's also assigned to this bypass control over here. So let's take a look at the envelopes. This is your attack time. As you can see, there's no indicator to show you what the value is set at, so you need to set this by ear. Then there's your sustain level. And when you bring your sustain down, your decay time comes into play. Since this is the amp envelope, it is affecting the volume of the sound. We also have a release time. I'll bring that sustain level back up. Now, other than your usual attack, decay, sustain, and release controls, you can see there are a bunch of other parameters. For example, along with the attack time, you get an attack level. Visually on the graph, you can see what's happening over there. So you can eliminate the attack completely by bringing the level all the way down like this. So now your DK becomes more like a rise control. And this can be useful when you're using the envelope to modulate a filter cutoff. So that's your attack level. Uh, DK level is basically the sustain. There's also a looping section over here. So let's check out this looping feature. For this, let's actually use another envelope. Let's assign it to the filter cutoff. That didn't work, let's try that again. So click on that crosshair and drop it on the block. If that does for some reason, that's not working here. You can, I can also right click here and choose the modulator. So that'll be modulator number one. Click and drag to set the depth. I haven't loaded a filter yet, so let's click here and load in the low pass filter without resonance. Let's keep our amp envelopes uh, sustain level all the way up. Now let's go to this filter envelope. No attack, so I'll bring the attack all the way down. And now let's take a look at this looping section. So for this looping section to work, we need to switch from loop off to any value over here. The maximum it goes up to is infinity, but just below infinity you get 32 steps. So you can have 32 loops, or you can have it infinite, 
or you can completely turn it off. Let's try, let's say, five steps. So you notice now the envelope basically loops this area five times and then it moves on to the next step. So it still starts from here, goes to the attack, goes to the um, DK, and then it kicks into this looping stage. If I set this to infinite, it's going to be stuck there forever. Well, as long as I'm holding down the notes. You can adjust the loop length, make it longer or shorter. And what's cool is that you can modulate this while the sound is being played. You can adjust the level over here. To adjust this, you basically adjust your sustain level. So that's how that looping feature works. Now, right now, the shape is this first shape over here, but I can click here and pick from any of these alternate shapes. Let's try peak expo times twice. Let's try another one, curve two. Now you, you notice there are two slots over here, so you can have two different shapes and you can morph between them with this morph tile. So the morph tile all the way to the left, you're using that first shape, and the morph tile all the way to the right, you're using that second shape. And anywhere in the middle, you get a blend between the two. All right, and lastly, you also get a delay feature. So the delay will just delay the onset of this envelope. So let's say if I put that delay up to that value, whatever that value is, I'm gonna play a chord. So you notice the envelope kicked in a bit later. Let's move that even further away. So it's a nice way to delay the onset of a particular control. Now, for some reason, I've let go of the notes, but the note is stuck. So we can hit that panic button to kill the sound. Now, other than these dials over here, you also get velocity control for the envelope. So for example, on envelope four, which is our amp envelope, if I crank this up, now the sound is gonna be responsive to velocity. Meaning if I hit harder on the keyboard, I'm going to get a loud sound, but if I hit softer, the volume is going to be softer. So that's velocity sensitivity for an envelope. Then there's also key tracking. So as you play higher notes, the volume reduces, and as you play lower notes, the volume increases. So that's how the envelopes work in Massive. LFOs. So I'm going to take this LFO and drop it on my filter cutoff. Click and drag to set a range. Also, I'm going to load in a filter here, get rid of resonance. So now when I play, I'm going to play a bit higher. You can hear that cutoff being modulated with the LFO. So let's look at the controls on the LFO. Uh, right now, we have two shapes over here, and we're, we're using a combined result of the two shapes, but I can just move the slider all the way up, so we only use this first shape, which is a sine wave. Oh, I can move the slider all the way down, so we only use this shape, which is a ramp down sawtooth shape. You can also adjust the phase of the LFO by clicking and dragging like this. Same for the sine wave. You have these four preset shapes over here. So sine, sawtooth, square, and triangle. 
By the way, you can double click to reset the shape back to default. But you also get additional shapes over here. So some more interesting ones like triplet ramps or the Chinese roof. Random ones, etc. I'll switch back to the sign shape. Over here, you have the rate control for the LFO. So make it go faster or slower. And you can also sync it to your project BPM. So now it's musical subdivisions of your bar. So you have that option for its sync. Uh, you can make the LFO restart on every new note. So if I slow this down. You notice every time I play, it always starts from that particular phase. But if I turn this off, every time I play, it starts at a different phase because the phase is not linked to uh, note on. Amp, or basically level control for this LFO. So you can think of this to be very similar to your modulation depth. So if I reduce my modulation depth, I'm doing the same thing. But the thing is, the reason why you have this is because you can actually assign the same LFO to multiple parameters. Like for example, if I put it to this wavetable position here. So now I have different de depth controls for these two parameters, but I have this one control to bring the entire LFO down. All right, so I'll remove that. Option double click to completely remove it. There's a mono button over here. So let's use this sawtooth shape for a second. Speed that up a bit. Now if I play slightly arpeggiated, So you notice as I'm adding and removing different notes, the phase of all the different modulations on each note is not aligned up. But if I switch this to mono, and it's clipping there a bit. But every time I play a new note, the entire LFO restarts for all the different notes. Of course, you can turn off restart and keep that mono on. So now the phase doesn't restart, but it's all one LFO being applied to all the different nodes. So that's what that mono button does. You also get an internal envelope. So this internal envelope can be assigned by clicking on that crosshair and dropping it on either this X fade curve option, the rate or the amp. So let's try it on the rate. So we can do interesting things like this. Let's make this mono again. It's a very simple envelope that only has attack and decay controls. When the decay is at the maximum, it's become infinite, meaning it's almost like a sustain. So you can do interesting things like that. So that's the LFO. Got the performer. I'll change this LFO to a performer and let's assign it to the filter cutoff. Let's load in a filter here. I'll reduce the resonance. I click and drag to adjust the depth. So you notice that it's not a bipolar control like the LFO, it's unipolar. You can have it in the opposite direction by clicking and dragging in the other direction. But unlike the LFO, which was bipolar, the performer just has one direction. Now the left side over here is identical to the LFO. So you get your rate control for the performer. You can sync it to your project tempo. You can restart on every note on, and you can adjust the amplitude of that performer. So with the performer, you get 16 of these steps, and you can choose between this upper lane or this bottom lane. And you can click and drag here to adjust what the shape is gonna be like. And this is gonna be your resulting modulator. 
we have an X fade sequence slider over here. So if this is all the way up, you're gonna be using this upper lane. If this is all the way down, we're gonna be using the bottom lane. Let's try the upper lane first. You can see that playhead move. Let's speed that up a bit. You get a maximum of 16 steps, but you can click and drag and make that shorter. You can even have odd numbered steps. You can even start from anywhere other than the first step by clicking and dragging that yellow marker there. So I'm starting from step six, but cycling through the entire thing. Let's try the bottom sequence. Now when you set this X fade sequence to the bottom, you can still use these upper or use the upper lane for specific steps by just turning off any of these buttons over here. So for the ones that are off, the step that's going to be loaded is the, or the step that's going to be used is the upper one. So let's just look at this first one over here. Let's make it very obvious. So this is all the way down and this is all the way up. So when I play a note, this particular shape is going to be used for that first step. First step and then this shape is going to be used for that second step. Let's actually move that playhead to the beginning. But if this was on, you can see that this shape was used. All right, let me turn these all back on. You also have this amp modulation control. So let's say I'll bring this all the way down. And for any step that I want the volume to be completely off, I can just click on this bottom area over here. So the buttons that are on will follow the amplitude that is set with the slider. So if it's all the way down, those steps are gonna be completely off. So basically no modulation. Let's just create a shape like that. But if you don't want it to be all the way down, you can also bring it up a bit. So it's still that same shape, but it's a bit softer. Now, instead of choosing these shapes, you can also click over here to load more interesting shapes. For example, let's try this exponential one and click and drag to assign that particular shape to a bunch of different slots. Let's close this load curve and make sure we're using the upper lane. Let's pick some of these triplet ones, 16th note ones, the double ones. And you can also just randomize it by hitting that button there. You can choose what to randomize. You can choose to randomize upper levels, upper curves, upper performer lower ones or just all of them. So if I just hit that button now, I guess it's set to all, so everything is being randomized. So that's the performer. The stepper is like a step sequencer. So you get these different steps and I can assign this to any control. Let's assign this to pitch. Let's set this to a range of 12. So now when I play a note, if I speed that up, based on the value given over here, this pitch will be switched to that. So you have a range from zero all the way up to 12. So that's why I chose 12 over here. Now if you want this to sound a bit more musical, you may want to set these to whole number values and it can be a bit hard to find whole number values, but there's a snap to grid option, which will snap it to whole number values. So now when I click and drag, I'm only selecting whole number values. So let's create an interesting sequence. All these controls are very much the same like the LFO and the performer. 
uh, we have this glide mod option. So right now it's stepping through the different steps, but if I turn on glide for some steps, it's going to glide to those steps. And this is your glide time. If it's too long, it can sound a bit weird. You also have this amp mod control just like the performer, so some steps can be completely turned off or set all the way down to zero. So you can hear those steps are all set to the lowest value, which is just the original pitch. This also has a randomize option, so you can randomize those values. But when you randomize it, you'll notice that those steps, well, when I click on it, it snaps to grid, but if I turn off snap to grid, you'll see that those steps were not snapped to the grid. So randomize doesn't quite work if you want to create something that follows your equal tempered tuning. So that's the step sequencer. The macro control. The assignments are very similar to how you would assign any of the envelopes or LFOs. So you can just click and drag the crosshair and drop it on any particular parameter. And then you can click and drag to set a particular range for it. So now this particular dial is going to control that wavetable position. By default, that first dial is always assigned to vibrato. So if you go back in to your oscillator tab, you have this vibrato thing you can see over here. And this first macro has been assigned to that. So let's choose this second macro here and let's assign it to something else like the filter cutoff. So I'll t load in a filter here. Uh, let's increase the depth. So now I can click and drag here to play with that filter cutoff in that particular range. Let's bring that vibrato down. You can also right click here and MIDI assign this. You can also rename this. The main purpose of doing this instead of just controlling it directly from here is to limit the range. So right now when I move this dial, it's only working in this particular range, not the entire range of that dial. Now aside from these eight dials that you can use as macro controls, you also get these four additional controls, key tracking, velocity sensitivity, aftertouch, and trigger random. So I can say key tracking can be assigned to any parameter that does not have key tracking. So cutoff already has key tracking and pitch already has key tracking, but let's say wavetable position. So now let's pick a more complex wavetable like Herbie. So now depending on which key I press, the wavetable position is going to be modulated. Maybe let's try Chrome. Without key tracking. And with key tracking. So the timbre is changing because the wavetable position is also changing at the same time. So that's basically how all these four work. Um, trigger random is interesting. So I can take this trigger random and try the same thing on wavetable position. So every time I trigger a note, it picks a random value from any of the available positions. If I want to make this a bit more subtle, we can do something like that. A more useful thing for this could be assigning it to pitch. So every time I play a new note, it's going to be slightly out of tune. Let's turn on a second oscillator to make it interact with that out of tune oscillator. Let's set it both to a sawtooth. It's clipping a bit, reduce the master volume. And of course, if that range was much wider, like let's say 12, I'm playing the same note again and again. 
but you're hearing a different pitch for oscillator one. So that's basically your macro control and you can set up these and also save your MIDI settings for this. So if I have MIDI assigned any of these controls, when I hit that save MIDI, it just gets saved. So every time I load in a new preset, the MIDI assignments will stay the same. Now check out the oscillator tab. There's a glide option over here. Now the glide only works in monophonic mode. So you need to go to your voicings tab and switch to any of these two monophonic modes. I'll choose monophon. And now when I play different notes, you can hear the glide. This is your glide time. Make it quicker or really slow. You can have it equal, meaning it doesn't matter what note you start from and what note you end up on. Even if it's a semitone or two semitones apart, that glide time is going to be the same. But if you set it to rate, if the notes are closer, the glide time is much shorter. But if the notes are far apart, then the glide time actually follows what you have set over here. So it scales based on the distance of the two notes. Next, you have your pitch bend control for your MIDI pitch bend wheel. So this has a range of plus 24 to negative 24. You can also completely turn it off by setting it to zero. Then you have oscillator phases. So you can choose to reset the phase of the oscillator by turning this on and setting a particular phase. So for example, if I have all three oscillators on, I'm gonna detune them slightly. Let's get rid of that glide for a second. So right now all the three oscillators are starting exactly at the same time. In fact, let's not detune them so you make this more obvious. If it wasn't, you notice the volume is a bit soft and also you get that strange phasing type effect. But if reset via gate is on and they're all starting at the zero crossing, it's a much louder sound. But of course you can change that up. And I can't really tell where exactly this is, but you can kind of approximate it based on those values up top here. So that's reset via gate. Next is a vibrato option. So by default, when you load up a blank preset or that file new sound thing, your first macro control is basically controlling your uh, rate and depth of the vibrato. So you can create vibrato by using an LFO, but you don't have to because you just have this already set up for you. So if I just crank up that one macro dial, you hear the vibrato, which is essentially increasing this depth and rate control at the same time. There's a mono button for that, so every note gets the same vibrato amount, very similar to the LFO. We looked at that earlier, LFO as well as the performer, as well as the stepper, they all have that mono button. So same thing, how it works over here. There's an internal envelope over here as well. So for example, I can assign this internal envelope to my depth control, uh, maybe even the rate. So now this macro is no longer controlling the vibrato, the internal envelope is. So if I play a note, let's give it a longer attack time. So you can hear how that vibrato kicks in gradually. So that's your oscillator tab. Let's now check out the key tracking for your oscillator section as well as for your filter section. So the three oscillators, the mod oscillator, as well as the insert effects get separate key tracking shapes. So right now it's following this linear shape, but I can also click to, but I can also switch to user and then create my own shape. So by default, when you have a straight line like this, you get your equal temper tuning. So that's the C major scale. But if I play around with this and kind of mess that up. So I play that same C major scale and it sounds a bit strange. It's actually going down when I go up and vice versa. Let's try this. So that's going up way too high. So you can basically mess up your tuning like this. Uh, generally, you want to set that to linear, but if you're doing more experimental things, you can play around with this. 
Now you may wonder why the insert effects has that option. It's because one of the insert effects, the frequency shifter specifically relies on pitch. So this can be key tracked. So that's key tracking for the oscillator, which I rarely ever mess with, but the key tracking for the filter is very helpful. So we have two filters and you get two different shapes that you can set up. So let's load in our filter. So as I play higher notes, that filter cutoff is actually opening up more. But if you want to be more exaggerated, I can do this. And you can clearly hear how the filter cutoff is opening up as I play higher notes. So that was set one. I can also switch to set two and create a different shape, maybe going downwards. You can barely hear those higher notes because of the excessive key tracking. So filter one is now using set two. Let's switch back to set one. Now you'll see another grayed line there. That line is also key tracking, but not for the filter cutoff. Apparently it is for the resonance, but I've tried this out and it doesn't really make much of a difference. As I change that filter cutoff key tracking, for that same note, you can hear how it actually changes the value. But for the resonance, as you can hear, it doesn't seem to be affecting it at all. No matter what that resonance value is set to as well. So you can ignore the resonance key tracking and just focus on the filter cutoff key tracking. So that's the key tracking options for your oscillator as well as the filter. Now for the voicing tab. Over here you can set the maximum polyphony. This can go up to 64 voices. But the more voices you use up, the more CPU is going to be used up. So just be aware of that. I'll switch this back to 16. And then you have your unisono option. So if I crank this up to two, when I play one note, I'm actually using two voices. If I crank this up to three, when I play one note, I'm using three voices, so on and so forth. We'll get back to this when you look at the unisono spread. Let's talk about these options here. So in polyphon means you're playing polyphonic, or it lets you play more than one note at a time. Monophon means it's only gonna let you play one note at a time. And of course the glide kicks in. If you have some glide over here, glide time, let me get rid of that. So no glide, but it's still monophonic. Now the difference between monophon and monorotate is explained in the manual over here. So monorotate is a special monophonic mode in which the two notes are always played alternatively. If a new note is played while the previous one is still held, the old note will stop and the new one will start, just as in the normal monophonic mode described above. However, the old one will be faded out quickly to ensure that the abrupt stop of this note will not cause a click. So let's find out if that's actually true. So I'll switch to a sine wave. So now those clicks are a bit more obvious. Now that click is happening also because of probably some attack time. We can uh, adjust that on our amp envelope here. We already have some attack time. Without any attack, that click is even more obvious. But you notice if I play legato, that click doesn't happen because it's just your attack time there. So that's monophonic mode. Let's try the mono rotate mode. So we still get the click when you play a note, but you always get a click when you restart another note. In monophon, you only get a click when you play your first note, but if you're playing legato, none of those notes have that click. Now I can get rid of the initial click by adding some attack. So no click at all. Let's go back to mono rotate. No clicking there as well. So it's a bit hard to really differentiate between the two. But if you were to follow the manual, it's not quite true that this one reduces clicking sounds. I believe this one actually gets rid of the click sound when you don't have any attack at all. Anyway, moving along, there's your trigger option. So trigger always meaning it'll always restart those envelopes 
Or you can do the legato thing. So it does not restart the envelope. Let's make a very obvious example of maybe modulating your filter cutoff. Let's choose a square waveform. So when I play legato, you notice that that envelope does not re-trigger. You only hear it for that very first note and then you don't hear it repeat. If I set it to always, for every note that envelope restarts. With legato triller, you can do stuff like this. So hold down a note and then quickly play another note and you can hear how it's quickly alternating between those two notes. If you're in a regular legato mode, you can't do that. All right, so let's switch back to polyphonic mode and let's talk about this unisono. So as I mentioned, when you crank up the unisono over here, for every note, those are the number of voices that are gonna be used. Let's switch back to a sawtooth. Let's get rid of that filter for now. So I'm playing one note and you can see three voices are being used. But that doesn't sound any interesting, it just sounds a bit louder. But when you play with the unisono spread, it can be a lot more interesting. For example, we can turn on this pitch cutoff. So now each of those voices are gonna be spread in terms of the tuning. And that has that chorusing or richness to the sound. I'll reduce the master volume there. That's within the range of zero to one semitone. I can reduce that even further. So I have a range of zero to 0.3 semitones. And you can really narrow it down. Generally, you want a very subtle detuning between the different voices. But of course, you can crank this up all the way to the maximum. It goes up to 12. So now when I play one note, you can hear the lowest. All those three voices are exactly the same tuning. But if I play with that, the voices are spread across a range of an octave. Now we're in centered mode, meaning all the three voices are spreading away from that center note that I'm playing. I'm playing a C here. But if I choose chord mode, let's try uh, maybe a seven. So it's gonna be a fifth above. As opposed to centered. Where all the voices go away from that C note. Might be a bit more obvious with just two voices. So you can hear one voice stays on C in the chord mode, but in centered, both the voices go away from C. So you're gonna get a bit more musical results with, uh, sorry, chord. So here's a little trick you can do if you set this all the way up to the maximum, which is 12. For some reason, it's not going up to 12 now. There you go, 12. Uh, you notice there's a rectangular block here, so we can assign a modulator to this. So I'll assign this envelope over here. Let's move this all the way to the lowest and click and drag so it's gonna uh, modulate all the way up to the highest value. And let's create a long attack and sustain at full. So now let's hear this. Let's crank up the unisono. I'll add some reverb for dramatic effect. So you can do interesting things like that. All right, next is wavetable position. So just like how the pitch is spread across the different unisono voices, you can also make the wavetable position also change across the different voices. So as I increase this, you have a range of zero to 100, meaning the maximum range for that wavetable position. 
let's get rid of this. Let's set this back to one. So now when I'm playing that note, all the three voices don't have the same wave table position. Next you have pan position, so when you turn this on, you can leave all the voices monophonic in the center like that. Or you can make it more spread out in the stereo uh, image. And that can always sound much better. So that's your voicing tab. Let's now check out the global tab. You have an init patch option over here, so you can hit that to initialize the preset. Though it is a bit different compared to when you hit file new sound, you can see the parameters have changed up. I prefer file new sound, that sounds more like an initialized preset compared to this option over here. Global tuning, preset BPM, there's global quality and preset quality that we saw over here previously. The main thing that you get in this global tab is this randomization feature over here. So you can choose what you want to randomize, like for example the oscillator settings, the filter settings, the insert or the master effects and then you can choose what of those settings you want to uh, randomize. So let's say I want to randomize the type selection and let's say I want to randomize the master effects. So I'll hit that random button. Right now nothing's loaded in, but you'll see that it randomly loaded in a particular effect and that keeps changing up. Let's say I also want to randomize the actual parameters for that master effects. By the way, this is a percentage of how much it's going to randomize. If you crank that up to a higher value, it's going to be heavily randomized. But if you reduce that to a lower value, the change is going to be a bit subtle. So that was for the master effects, type select, parameter, modulation depth, connections. Let's try connections. I don't have any connections set up yet. So if I randomize that, I guess the connections, let's increase that amount. Yeah, so the connections won't get randomized unless you actually introduce something in. So let's just randomly drop some modulators in here. And now you can see those are changing up. So if I just enable all these options and hit randomize there, you can see even the value depth is also being randomized. Watch out for the master volume. Insert effects, let's randomize some of that. They're not on yet though. Let's turn them both on. Filter settings. Oscillator settings. Now when you randomize the oscillator settings, it also randomizes the pitch, which may not be a good thing. So what we can do is turn on keep pitch. So it's going to randomize everything except pitch. And lastly, you can also have options for copying settings. So let's say you like the settings of the oscillator, you can just hit copy there and then go to File, New Sound, and then paste it in. And now we have those oscillator settings. You can just hit Copy All and then Paste All as well. So that is Native Instruments Massive. I hope you enjoyed that. Stay tuned for more.